Okay, for the next talk, uh, Margarita David Lovett will speak about logical operation in Plotikas. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm excited to share our recent um, insights into Plotikas that are related to uh, trying to perform quantum computation with them. This work has, uh, was done jointly with my collaborators, Ned, who's a postdoc at Caltech, Shankar, who's a fellow graduate student at MIT, and Dave, who's a researcher at Microsoft. So I'd like to thank them. And um, so, um, yeah, so when it comes to uh, quantum error correction with stabilizer codes, the paradigmatic example would be the Tori code. Uh, what we imply is that we have to measure the stabilizers of the Tori code for an amount of time that scales with the distance of the code. If if there's any probability of measurement errors. So what these measurements do, they project us onto the subspace from which it is convenient to perform error correction done back to the ground state. And if the error probability is not too high, we will successfully correct uh, the state. So uh, viewed from this perspective, Tori code is actually the simplest example of a Floquet code, the trivial of Floquet code, because we keep repeating measurements in time. Uh, now, the first non-trivial example of a Floquet code is the famous Hastings Honeycomb code, where we perform instead two qubit measurements that don't commute between different uh, rounds in time, but we also actually realize story code at each point in time. And um, though the uh, specific uh, microscopic details of the story code change from round to round, and that happens periodically in time with, with um, period three. So now this code is also capable of uh, correcting, of, it's also quantum error correcting code, but it also has this additional property that it exchanges logical operators every three rounds, which I'm going to talk about a lot. And um, this summarizes what a general Floquet code is, even though there does not exist a rigorous definition, uh, what we want Floquet code to be is a sequence of low weight measurements that could anti-commute between different rounds uh, that preserves logical information, but also corrects errors. Um, and yeah, so, so then this measurement sequence basically defines the Floquet code and is responsible for, yeah, for, for pushing information forward in time and also for extracting information about errors. Uh, so now, um, yeah, so what, when it comes to full tolerant quantum computation, we want to do universal quantum computation, but we also want to keep the logical state encoded while we do so. And we also want the errors to not propagate too much when we apply uh, each unitary. Uh, and this brings us, uh, so this topic has been studied in and out in poly stabilizer codes, and there is a large toolbox, and this is by no means a comprehensive overview, it's just like a few bullet points. So the favorite methods of doing uh, gates would be transversal gates because it, in, in requires, it, it, it requires basically no space-time overhead. And uh, transversal gates are naturally uh, fault tolerant because uh, they're finite depth and local, meaning that the errors cannot propagate. And um, however, uh, for poly stabilizer codes, there does not exist a single code which would admit a universal transversal gate set. And moreover, the dimension will limit our ability to go to a certain levels of Clifford hierarchy. And this problem is usually solved by code switching, but that comes at the um, cost of uh, spatial overhead. Then um, other methods uh, such as lattice surgery and defect braiding would uh, um, give us Clifford gates and polystabilizer codes in two dimensions. There would be as much uh, spatial overhead, but there will be temporal overhead. And then there, for non-Clifford gates, um, people usually do magic state injection. Now, uh, for Floquet codes, since at each point in time we actually have a stabilizer group, we could, uh, in principle, adopt any of the methods available for poly stabilizer codes. And to a certain extent, this has been done in the literature, such as lattice surgery and twist defects. However, in this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about a different way of uh, doing quantum computation with Floquet codes. Specifically, it turns out that we can absorb the logical gate that we want to implement into the measurement sequence itself. So by choosing an appropriate measurement sequence, uh, we can get either identity gate, or we can get also to the same code, but we can also implement a non-trivial gate in our logical information. And moreover, we can compose those short measurement sequences together with each other, such that we can get the desired sequence of gate and thus perform log like logical operations on the code. And uh, the construction that we come up, came up with that does precisely that is called dynamic automorphism codes. And I'll explain why we call it that later. Um, and not for K codes notice anymore because it doesn't have to be periodic. So it, it just has to be dynamic. 
So in order to explain how this works, I need to explain atomorphisms first. So by atomorphisms, I really mean uh, atomorphisms of the topological order. So really in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, uh, floquet codes where the, or dynamic codes uh, where instantaneous stabilizer group at each step is that of a topological code. And Ben gave a decent introduction into topological, <laughs> into topological codes today, so maybe I don't need to repeat that. Maybe one thing I want to emphasize again is that uh, the excitation, upon measuring the stabilizers, the excitations are projected onto the natural excitations of these topological models, which are the endpoints of strings in two dimensions and boundaries are other endpoints of strings in three dimensions, so boundaries of uh, membranes in on three dimensions as well. And uh, that's how we get logical operators. We take those strings, we wrap them around the trivial cycles, and we get a logical operator in two dimensions. And we also get uh, sheets in three dimensions by wrapping those loops around the, like, the surface. That's going to be important. So uh, now automorphins are the, the topological order. In other words, are topological symmetries. So these are for, uh, these are, sorry, anion permutation symmetries. So these are ways to permute the labels of anions, exchange the anions um, <clears throat> such that uh, the algebra of, the mutual algebra of anion strings is preserved under this permutation. And um, because we permute anions, we also permute respective logical operators that we generate by those anions. And permuting logical operators means that we have uh, have done a quantum gate, a logical operation. So this is how uh, atomorphisms of the topological order for topological codes is related to uh, logical operations on the respective um, quantum code. Yeah. So now uh, the simplest example of an atomorphism is the EM atomorphism of the Tori code. So this is an example of a square lattice Tori code where the excitations are endpoints of Z strings that live on the vertices or uh, X, uh, co-strings that live on plaquettes. And then the uh, EM atomorphism uh, postulates that we can exchange these anions and this will be a symmetry of the code. And now uh, the respective um, logical strings that are generated by these anions will be a Z string and an M string. And these logical strings ha also have to be exchanged under this symmetry. So uh, Tori code possesses the symmetry under exchange of logicals and anions simultaneously. Uh, so, and also you can uh, play the same game on different lattices and moreover, uh, you can actually forget about like, like um, because these are topological models, uh, what I'm saying is true for any uh, triangulation of a manifold. So in reality, this is lattice independent so, independent. so when it is convenient, we can abstract away from the lattice and just think about, you know, the topological data of these uh, models and, and later on we can like find an appropriate microscopic representation of all of that. Um, so just to summarize, um, abstracting from the lattice, this is what an EM atomorphism look like, looks like. And this is uh, where the um, atomorphisms of the color code come from as well. These are symmetries that permute the anions of the color code. This is just examples. It's, it's not supposed to be comprehensive. And another important concept are the domain walls associated with automorphisms. For example, if we have Tori code in two subspaces and the two, these two Tori codes um, are adjacent to each other, but they differ by the automorphism, it means that there will be a domain wall between them and uh, the particle, the excitations will be able to go through this domain wall, but they, they will have to change their type according to the automorphism. But also if there was a logical operator was somehow able to push this logical operator through the domain wall, you would have to change its type. And similar, similarly for the color code, the green and blue color permuting of automorphism will have, will make any anion of green color change to the, the appropriate anion of the blue color. And these domain walls can be spatial, and this is uh, this come this brings us a familiar uh, EM domain wall in the Tori code. And if this such a domain wall, for example, terminates in the bulk of the model, we'll have twist, twist defects. So these are defects of this automorphism, um, or it could be a temporal domain wall where the entire model simultaneously everywhere in space undergoes the same automorphism. But then it means that between uh, the, the in initial point in time and the final point in time, we have exchanged respective uh, logical strings. And that means that the code has undergone a logical operation. So that's a domain wa wall point of view 
uh, on logical operations. Okay, so now uh, atomorphisms can naturally arrive from measurement sequences of Floquet codes. And let me explain how. Uh, so this is a um, hastings ha honeycomb code. And in fact, this is a unitarily equivalent representation of it uh, to what you'll find in the, in the original paper. So at each round, we measure a poly two-body operator on a link of a given color. And then we'll cycle between uh, different Tori codes at each round. So now, upon completing such a cycle, we'll come back to the same code, but the, and the logical information will survive in some sense, but we won't come back actually to exactly the same state. We'll come back to the same logical information, but it will have undergone the EM automorphism. And I'll explain how it uh, occurs in just a bit. So in order to understand it, we actually need to invoke the concept of any condensation that Bennett has been talking about, and hopefully actually will answer some of the questions that people had to this talk. Um, so uh, for any condensation, we need to specify a parent model. There does not exist a unique way to specify a parent, and uh, the rule of thumb is that we want a model uh, that contains every logical operator of every step of the Floquet code. And it also contains all these stabilizers over every step of Floquet code. And the reason why we want this is because we want to be able to obtain every step of Floquet code from the same parent model. Um, now, um, and now each step of Floquet code can, should be, it should be possible to obtain it by any condensation from that parent model. Um, Okay, so for example, again, going back to the classic example for the honeycomb code, the parent model is the color code. And um, yeah, and you've already heard about it quite a bit. And the um, bosons of the uh, color code can be arranged to a magic square. And we call it magic square because the uh, fusion rules uh, of, this, uh, of these anions actually um, re remind the rules of the magic square. Uh, so the, you can add the rows to one and you can add the... Uh, you can, columns to one, and uh, also uh, braiding is also seen from the um, from this arrangement. For example, anything that is in the same column or row braids trivially with a given uh, boson. In terms of uh, logical strings and excitation, braiding means commutation, and uh, fusion means means just addition, addition rules. Oh, sorry, not addition rules. Uh, okay, and then finally, color code is equivalent, unitarily equivalent to two copies of the Tori codes, which means that we can also label everything by um, excitations of two independent Tori codes, and that is also very convenient. And um, all these uh, fusion and braiding rules are also seen from the properties of the Tori codes that might be more familiar to people. Now, um, EM atomorphism can be very nicely understood from perspective of any condensation. So this is basically the same picture as Ben has been showing, just in slightly different notations. So here I'm assuming that I have condensed an Rx boson. That means that I have measured X, X operators on red edges, and I, I have done so starting from the color code model. That actually forces these excitations to confine. So these are not now not, um, not the errors that we naturally will obtain by projecting into the eigenstates of the color codes. And these will be deconfined. However, our Y and our Z excitations will be equivalent to each other up to stabilizers, because if I multiply our Y by our X, I'll get our Z. And similarly, GX and BX will be equivalent to each other. So in fact, these will form equivalence class, one equivalence class, and these will also form one equivalence class. And now we come up with different labels. So this will be an E label, and this will be an M label. And the way to see it from the Tori codes, it's especially nice from the Tori codes, because in the Tori code, we condense an M excitation in the second Tori code. It means that this one becomes trivial, but then these two anions differ by an M excitation in the second Tori code. So they, they must be equivalent. And then uh, if we look at this excitation, it's just E anion in the first copy of the Tori code, and that's why I label it E. Uh, and similarly, on the algebraic level, the code level, uh, these are this tells us about the algebra of string excitations and the algebra of logical operators that remain in the code. And now maybe answering Nico's question, when we talk about a Floquet code as a sequence of condensations, we don't mean that we actually condense something starting from this first step and we condense something and get to the second step. Actually, when we talk about Floquet codes from any condensation, we mean that there is a color code and we are able to get each step separately from the color code by condensing something from the color code. So when you go from the color code by condensation to a Tori code, uh, in fact, you uh, decrease your distance by two. 
but you can show that your anion strings still remain uh, non trivial cycles and the distance like still remains extensive, right? And uh, now when you go between round and round, uh, in reality, there is no direct way to go from round to round on condensation, by condensation. This is not a well-defined um, concept, but measurements man manage to do this. When you do a measurement, it almost looks like you go from this instance of something that we obtain by condensation from the color code to this instance. Uh, but by measurement, you can just kind of, it looks like you can go directly, but it's just not, not, not by condensation technically. So technically measurement first uncondenses and then condenses the new object. So that's what the measurement does, but it's kind of hidden. Um, so, okay, so how do we see that the logical information is conserved from round to round? Um, but the, basically, it means that for every represent for, for every type of the logical operator, for example, for this one, there exists one of the equivalent representatives that is shared with the next round. For example, for this this type of logical string, there will be uh, th this representative R Y is shared with the next round. It's also deconfined in the next round. It's a legal uh, logical operator, of, uh, sorry, logical string of the next round, uh, and similarly for. Uh, the other type for X type uh, string or for M type string, there is a logical operator that is shared between the rounds. And that's how we know that the logical information, there, there's a basis, the full basis of logical operators that is shared between the two rounds. And it's true for every pair of rounds here, which means that the logical information is inherited from round to round. Now, let us just pick one representative of the logical operator and follow it through the, uh, through the sequence of a Floquet code. So basically, if we start with this RZ string, it's in the same equivalence class as RY string. R, so an RY string is what is shared with the next round. So we can multiply it by whatever we had in our Sibelese group of the current round to get the other string. And that's the string that is inherited to the next round. Now, RY string is, does not survive in third round, but there exists an equivalent representative by what we measured in this round that can be taken to the next round. Now, finally, this object is also not inherited to next one, but there's an equivalent one that is. And this way, I, I kept actually multiplying what I started with by uh, what I condensed in each, with what I measured in each round. So I actually pick up a, like a string of measurements from each round. So by the time I come back to the same Tori code, I, got, I kind of picked up a string of measurements that I had to keep multiplying my logical operator with. But after I've done so, I actually come back to the logical operator of the to original Tori code, but it's a different logical operator. It's an X type or M type logical operator. And that's why an EM automorphism happens. We have to pick something up to, uh, to find uh, like um, mutual basis of logical operators between each pair of codes. But it turns out that once you complete a cycle, uh, like you, you, you made an untrivial transformation. Uh, no, they are not. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, no, no, no. I label it once and for all. This is a reference labeling. So th this is an M. So E anion turns into an M anion. It, it just label. Yeah, it, it's just my convention for what I label to be E and what I label to be M. Yeah, so this summarizes an E M automorphism in the honeycomb code. Now, uh, and I just wanted to, that actually answers Sneaker's question again, or, or no, I think it's someone else's question. Basically, like whether this is lattice dependent, and no, it's not. For example, yeah, if you're interested, ask me, but there exists a honeycomb code in a square lattice. I don't think it's anywhere in the literature, but it's very easy to write down. The only price we have to pay is that uh, other microscopic realizations might not minimize the weights of operators we measure at each round. So the color code is optimal in this sense. And yeah, so, so basically this picture is microscopic realization independent. You can find many different microscopic models corresponding to this. Now, um, again, going back to this useful domain wall picture. So as we saw before, an EM automorphism in the regular Tori code can be seen as this. But in Floquet code, it looks like we first start with a given Tori code. Then we go to a slightly different Tori code to, to a different phase with a slightly different Tori code. Then we go to another phase and we go go back to the same Tori code. But if we like zoom out from here, we know that uh, th this must be equivalent to an EM domain wall. So in this sense, this uh, Floquet code cycle corresponds to implementing an EM domain wall. So this is sort of like a space-time picture of what's happening. Um, now, um, now that we, yeah. Um, 
Uh, in which code is not allowed? In the original Tori code, EM is allowed, but uh, E cross M. Yeah, sure. Uh, but in uh, this Tori code, E cross M is not allowed. Is that it, it's allowed so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, the same, it's the same Tori code. Yeah, it, it's, it's the vanilla Tori code that you get in some effective. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah, so now having this picture in mind, um, there is a larger picture that comes from any condensation. And the way to summarize this picture is actually by condensation graph that we came up with in our work. Basically, the vertices of the condensation graph are the objects that we condense. Or similarly, these are the uh, toricos, the child models that we obtain by respective condensation. For example, this would be the toricode that, that is obtained by condensing our axon mapping at axon And there are none of such toricodes. So we put them at the vertices of the condensation graph. Now, uh, whenever they're, whenever by measuring the next object, uh, um, I, I um, implement a transition that conserves logical information between these two toricodes, I draw an edge. So basically, uh, each reversible transition corresponds to an edge on the condensation graph. And now finally, if I follow a closed loop on the condensation graph, I'll come back to the same model, but I don't have to come back to exactly the same state. I might have undergone an automorphism. And that's why every closed loop is labeled by an automorphism. And for the honeycomb code, this condensation graph has a shape of torus, meaning that we actually uh, connect this and that one around, around the torus and, and similarly this and that. Now, uh, how are these uh, the closed loop on this condensation graph labeled by, labeled by automorphism? It turns out that um, any non-trivial cycle is labeled by an EM automorphism, non-trivial cycle around the torus. And every trivial cycle is a trivial automorphism. And then if we go around both cycles, like here, we'll get the CSS version of the Floquet code. And that goes no automorphism again, because it's kind of Z2. Uh, automorphism. Now, um, maybe the reason why it happens is because um, uh, EM automorphism technically corresponds to multiplying everything by a fermion. And you can actually, you have to pick up an odd number of objects as you go ar around the cycle in order to multiply by, an, by a fermion. And it turns out that any uh, contractible loop has an even length, and every non contractible loop has an odd length, apart from this one. Um, and uh, you cannot change the length of this loop by just deforming it. So that sort of explains why, like, so basically all length loops correspond to a natural automorphism and even length loop do not. So that summarizes the honeycomb code and brings us to... Did I tell you anything about which ones give you, like, a consistent set of detectives for... Not at all. It's very right. non-trivial to find which ones correspond to the correct codes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what's exactly your definition here? So where do you put faces and where do you not put faces? Faces? Oh, uh, I, mean, I mean, I just pick a sequence of condensation that gives me a sequence of measurements, right? And I'm only allowed to go along the edges of the graph between the vertices, and I can draw any loop at all. <coughs> that will define the sequence of measurements. Yes, but I mean, to, you said it's a torus. Yes. So you define faces to say it's a torus. So you, have the, you define the vertices and the edges. It's a, it's a graph with a toric, toric topology, right? So if I go around uh, around this direction. Yeah, I, I def uh, just geometrically. Yeah, but you could put a face on a non-trivial, like what would be a non-trivial face, and that's not a torus anymore. Uh, I could put a face on yeah, maybe we should talk about it. I mean, I mean, um, like this, this time, it's really a graph. It's it's cycle. Uh -huh. uh, face like Q. Well, technically, it is okay. So, so now this, this statement would be: it's an odd, odd odd length loop versus even length loop. Okay, so that's right. your definition of face. Yeah, okay. sure. Can you have degenerate cycles? Like, can you just stay and keep measuring the same pair? So, like he, from here to here and then back. Can you stay in one vertex or just move back and forth? In that I can. Uh, I can, and this will be legal in the sense that it will be conserved logical information. You will be able in a well defined code. But the problem is that um, not every cycle that I draw here will be error correcting. Because for error correction, I need to, um, to like, each point where the error can occur to be shared with by enough space time detectors. 
and that's actually not guaranteed by every cycle. So there's an additional layer here uh, that once I draw the cycle, I also need to inspect it for a correction. So the critical cycle will have the distal. It wants actually measure any, yeah, any. It wants to measure actually for full topological stability group, yeah. Um, but I mean, you can do it for a short period of time and then go on and, and go. So now this brings us to logical, sorry, to logical operations. For example, for uh, a Tori code on a torus, uh, the um, EM automorphism corresponds to exchanging logical X with a different logical Z string, and uh, that is a Hadamard times swap gate. Um, but can we get uh, like for K codes with other, with more automorphism, with other automorphism, and use those for quantum computation? And this brings us to the definition of dynamic automorphism codes, which are for K codes or condensation graphs that can do precisely that. Yes? Um, hi. Uh, just uh, on, the, on your previous slide, you said, like, as you go from, like, the X2 to the Z1, um, as you undergo the EM automorphism, yeah. like, this is like a logical gate, but um, if, if the logical information has to be conserved, does it also mean that your code words are... Like say going from Z to X, you go from zero to plus as well. Yes, yes, but it is conserved in the sense that uh, if you have a logical state and then you act with it uh, with unitary gates, the logical operation is still there. You don't like reset it. Well, I guess my um, my question is if, like if, if if it's true that C is uh, you know transforming to X and your code word zero yeah. is also transforming to plus, like have you really done a logical gate like? Um, like, could you really say you've done uh... Well, I mean, you can comp compare the, the initial state you started from uh -huh. with the final state you end up with in. And if you choose the same labeling of the logical operators and you, like, use that as a reference at the final point, your state will be different, objectively. Okay. So, for example, if, if the state, for example, is in the eigenstates of red Z operator, mm -hmm. After three rounds, it will be an eigenstate of blue X operator, right? So it's a different eigenstate. And like once it becomes more complicated, it makes even more sense to, to find it, right? Um, yeah, so uh, for a general dynamic automorphism code, um, there will be a more complicated graph with a bunch of different automorphisms. And we want to be able to go around uh, cycles in this graph and um, this way we will get a measurement sequence that implements a given automorphism. And then we also want to be able to take products of these to um, combine them together and get complicated long paths of measurements that combine a lot of gates and implement a more complicated quantum computation. And that's the essence of dynamic automorphism codes. So this brings me to explain, explaining how these work. Um, so so first, first I'll draw like a more general picture. So. Um, we can start by um, being quite modest and uh, demand that our every child model that we ever obtain is a poly stabilizer code. Uh, so that means that any strings that we will be talking about always will will always be logical poly strings, and then permuting these strings corresponds to permuting logical polys. But these are, these are this means we have only logical Clifford gates because Clifford gates are normalizers of poly group. Uh, so, which means that by automorphism in this case, we can get at most Clifford gates. And that's what we actually get in our paper. And we call these co the codes that are capable of doing so um, dynamic automorphism color codes, because we use a color code in the data stabilizer group to get this. Now, um, in three dimensions, the situation is more interesting. And this is because um, there are anion strings that are, say, logical poly Z operators. But then there will be also membranes that correspond to poly X operators. But there are also um, special excitations that people frequently ignore in the literature that correspond to Clifford operations uh, acting on membranes. And this corresponds to phase gates acting on membranes. But now uh, uh, an actual automorphism should be able to exchange any of these. But now the operator that exchanges poly with Clifford is actually third level of Clifford, Clifford hierarchy operator. And that's why three-dimensional codes, uh, stabilizer, poly stabilizer codes, have uh, non-Clifford operators. And we also are able to get them from dynamic automorphism codes. But in this case, we will need to perform measurements that are non-Pauli. Now, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk. But maybe to outline a larger picture, we could also, in principle, go beyond poly stabilizer codes. 
And in this case, uh, first of all, our instantaneous codes can be non-abelian, say, quantum doubles. And moreover, we should be able to go between abelian quantum doubles and non-abelian quantum doubles and back. And this way, we actually can complete a universal gate set. And if we want to do this fault tolerantly, in fact, it would take an order of distance amount of time. So it sort of looks like space-time overhead is still there. But we are able to do more than we would be able to do if we just remained in Pauli stabilizer world forever. And that's a matter of our upcoming work of, of, with me, with my collaborators, sorry. And there have been like uh, precluding works um, in the literature before. And yeah, but it's, it, there, there's a question to which extent these are really flakecos anymore because it's, it's just, it can be done by higher weight measurements. It doesn't have to be flakecos parameters. It might be just like dynamic way of doing quantum computation or dynamic protocols. So now this brings me to, sorry, <laughs> this brings me to dynamic atomorphism color codes. So the codes that can do Clifford, uh, Clifford and non-Clifford gates uh, and instantaneous groups are, um, Pauli stabilizer codes. So I wanted to say that this is as easy as a piece of cake. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, for comparison, so I put compiled everything into one um, table. Uh, for comparison, there there is a family of honeycomb codes. So the parent code for them is the color codes. Uh, the um, measurement that we perform are two-body Pauli measurements and the uh, child codes are the uh, different instances of Tori codes. Now, the, automorph the possible automorphisms that this code can achieve are the automorphisms of the child models of the Tori codes, but this is either a trivial one or an EM permuting one. And now, uh, the gate that we can obtain by, being, by implementing these automorphisms by measurement sequences is just like we have a possibility of uh, applying only one gate. Now, for uh, 2D dynamic color code, the parent code is surprisingly simple. It's just two copies of the color code. So it's like a bilayer. And the um, child models are obtained by measuring a two-body poly stabilizers, either only in each layer separately. And then that gives us a, two a pair of decoupled honeycomb codes, basically. And each of them can do an EM automorphism. Or we can measure a uh, vertex measurement between the two layers, and which is also poly, two-body poly measurement, and the code will be an effective color code at that point in time. Um, and now the atomorphism that we can obtain, actually, I, I just ruined the joke here again. Uh, so I usually ask people what is the number of, of atomorphisms, and this is a pretty arbitrary number. So, um, so it comes off as a surprise. So yeah, so uh, the, the atomorphisms that we should be able to get by this are the atomorphisms of the effective code that we obtain at each round. And these are all the permutation symmetries of the anions of the color code or two copies of the Tori code. And OK, so why are there 72? It's because um, actually it, it can be nicely seen from the anion table. Uh, because the anion table is arranged in such a way, the boson table, sorry, it's arranged in such a way that it respects the fusion rules and the braiding rules. So it respects the algebra already. So any allowed permutation symmetry of this table that such that the, re the resulting square will also uh, respect the algebra will be an allowed symmetry. And there are 72 of those. They're generated by column permutations, row permutations, and a flip with respect to diagonal, except we use a different basis for the symmetries. There are three generators for these symmetries, and we use a different basis because it's the nicest basis. Specifically, uh, these are two reflections with respect to two diagonals and a row permutation. And the reason why we chose this is because the, each of these reflection, if you look at what it does, it exchanges E and M in the first copy. And this one exchanges E and M in the second copy. So these are actually, uh, these are the actual, these, sorry, these actually come for free from the two decoupled copies of the, Tori, of the honeycomb code. So we don't have to design them ourselves. So the only new atomorphism we have to come up with in order to get 72 is this one. And this one is also especially simple because we only need to be able to exchange two colors of excitations. Um, okay, so now how do we do this? I, I'll sketch this out. So basically um, <clears throat> we start, we have a measurement sequence. It starts with the effective color code. So these are like those two body vertex measurements. And then it goes into, then it measures 
two body measurements in each layer separately, and it decouples color code into two Tori codes, one in each layer. Then it goes into different pair of Tori codes, then it goes back to the same kind of Tori code, and then it back, goes back into color code. As on the condensation graph, it will look like we're going there and back along the same cycle. So it doesn't actually make an untrivial cycle. And that's why it doesn't uh, a, a trivial automorphism. So it doesn't do any automorphism. But what we can do, we can take this um, last round of measurements before going back to color code again. And we can apply automorphism to the round of measurements. We can just like force the measurements to be the one that has undergone this automorphism. So we change green and blue in this round of measurements. So it will be this measurement instead. And then magically, it turns out that if we just follow this measurement sequence, um, by the time we come back to the color code, we have implemented a green-blue exchange in atomorphism. And that's how we get the last generator needed uh, to, to get all the atomorphisms of the color code. So now, which gates can we get by, from this? Uh, in fact, if we want to get a, full, a Clifford group, we have to use a color code with, code with boundaries, just like in the usual color code is transversal gates. And we use color code with um, um, poly, tri triangle with poly boundaries, uh, which defines a single logical qubit. And then we stack them on top of each other, and we need to come up with one additional gate, which is an entangling gate with, between the pairs of these triangles. And because of its slightly more complicated construction, we also need a three qubit measurements to couple different layers together at the edge, at one of the edges. So this also has a new kind of measurement. But this way we can uh, do automorphisms that uh, correspond to the entire Clifford group of logical operations. So that concludes the dynamic color code in two dimensions. Now in three dimensions, uh, the situation is also like uh, ridiculously simple. Uh, in the sense that it's just uh, we're just continuing to to generalize what we saw in the honeycomb code. Uh, so we take three copies of three-dimensional color code. It's it's the final of four colorable lattice. Now um, uh, the child model is a single three-dimensional color code, which is equivalent to three copies of 3D Tori code. That explains why we needed three copies to begin with, because we want to be able to decouple Tori codes from each of these parent models. And then it turns out that if we just want to get to any of these child models, we would need to measure uh, two body poly measurements. And their nature is like very, very similar to these ones. And uh, sometimes we would need to perform a non-poly measurement, specifically Clifford's measurement like that, um, if we want to, um, to get that non-Clifford gate. And finally, the gate that we get is the gate that exchanges X operator, X membranes, with X uh, times Clifford membranes. And um, yeah, and, and that corresponds to a non clifford gate. And the way we obtain it, I'm not go even going to show it. I'm just going to remind you how we got this gate, right? So similarly, for the three-dimensional case, we can start with three-dimensional color code, go through some trivial, uh, trivial automorphism, and then conjugate one of the steps with the non clifford gate that we want to obtain, getting a Clifford measurement instead. Uh, one caveat is that um, we would need um, to in insert, like, before doing that, we would need to insert a round of error correction. We would need to, first of all, correct all the uh, X-step errors, and we want to fix all the values of these stabilizers to plus one. But that's something you anyways routinely do if you want to do an unclifford gate in these codes. Uh, but still, it, it, it embeds uh, this code with a like dynamic frame. So basically, we would need to run a computation and make uh, the, the code itself ad adapt, like have, have a feedback on that. Okay, so that summarizes everything we achieved with dynamic color codes. Uh, yeah. How many qubits does each model encode? Um, just the same amount as the child model on a given manifold. Oh. Yeah, basically you can think about it as in terms of the ISG that you have at a given step. And maybe, maybe, yeah, this table is very complicated. So if uh, there is one take home message is that there are dynamic color codes in different dimensions that are capable of performing Clifford and non-Clifford gates uh, by choosing appropriate measurement sequences. And we got those measurement sequences and we got all the microscopic nail done as well. So now, um, yeah, I think I'm finishing early, so I'll have time for questions, I guess. Uh, so I hope I uh, convinced you to a certain extent that there exists a different way of looking at floquet codes, namely, um, 
even if we view the, uh, these measurement sequences as some more complicated syndrome extraction circuits, it turns out that um, these measurement sequences can already take into account for the logical operation that we want to make. And moreover, we can uh, combine those together in order to make uh, the desired quantum computation. And uh, the, big, the bigger picture is here. Uh, so basically, we sort of, to, to, to some extent, maybe apart from practical question, we exhausted the possibilities that we have with poly stabilizer codes in two and three dimensions. But there seems to be a huge landscape of what's possible if we go beyond poly stabilizer codes even a little bit. And it looks like we can get universal quantum computation in just two dimensions, just with temporal overhead. And uh, the open questions that I'd like to highlight are the, um, yeah, so achieving universal quantum computation, hopefully making it practical, then uh, uh, nailing down maybe the um, uh, bounds on uh, space-time overheads and on um, our, like the general landscape of what's possible with different phases. Uh, then uh, non-abelian and Diecos definitely have lots of interesting instances. And finally, topical to this workshop is um, uh, hopefully we will be able to do LDPC versions of dynamic codes and extend some of this to LDPC setting. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Um, could you explain again why you want you chose to generate all of your ultimate morphisms with uh, the two different transposes and one row? Yeah, it's because um, yeah. So so this atomorphism is actually um, an EM atomorphism in the first layer. Uh huh. This one is an EM atomorphism in the second layer. Okay, so you just need them to be coupled, and yes. you just do it on exactly. the target level. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this one is a new one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for the really nice talk. I think it's clear from it's clear from your talk and plans that these uh, from a condensed matter point of view, these are really interesting systems. And mm -hmm. I think they've already for Kegos in general have already made some quantitative improvements the like better thresholds in certain settings, lower weight measurements. But I, it seems to me that still there's there's no qualitative things that were just impossible with stable energy codes that are not possible with these codes. Like uh, in a fixed dimension, some gate that you can implement from some better kind of qualitative space time volume. Is that, is that the case? Or is that yeah, I, th I think there exist ultimate bounds that we are not able to go, yeah, to go beyond. And I think these, these like space time overhead bounds that we've already seen for stabilizer codes probably still apply. We just need to work this out. But I think that may, maybe the most interesting like is, stuff is coming from here. So what like what is not possible in stabilizer codes? Do you think Nothing that I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Nothing that we wouldn't be able to do a stabilizer codes in an ugly way. Probably everything in in some ugly way we would be able to get everything in stabilizer codes. I think that's true. Un unless you call these non stabilizer codes. I, I mean, these are not poly stabilizer codes, but you could still call them stabilizer codes. Wait, as someone is much more comfortable with like an, an algebraic picture as opposed to Like, how would I go about constructing kind of a more general, say, uh, like pairing code family that is going to have the types of automorphisms you need to get, say, all or most of the Clifford group when I go into like a flow cave code picture? And if it's in the flow cave code picture, will it kind of manifest in the stabilizer code picture for like a given time slice um, in a kind of code definition? Uh, interpretation of these things. Yes, I think I think stabilizer or algebraic picture is in one-to-one -one correspondence with any optimization picture, so it always will be in correspondence. Okay. But um, I mean, I, I'm not sure if there exists a general recipe of how to come up with new codes with given symmetries. It's kind of an art. Yeah. We only have so like not too many codes to begin with. 
and you might have exhausted them already with quantum doubles, so it just makes sense and some other like, models. But um, yeah, but but I think you could also do all of that algebraically. It's just you, people don't usually do it this way. <laughs> Yeah, can you do other condensation defects in this way, not automorphisms? Because here you created like the end line, right? So it's C2 mm -hmm. group like structure. Can you do like non invertible defects in this way? Or that yeah. would be interesting to know. Yeah. You haven't tried that? Not yet. Okay. Oh, actually, actually, I think non-invertible you can do by introducing, yeah. I, th I think you can do non-invertible ones. I, I, I think we know how to do that. All of them, like in this way, or some of them are for some reason non implementable? That we don't know yet. Okay. Well, I was going to say at the beginning, you said you wanted one parent model for all of the transformations. Yes. But, I mean, that's not necessary. Is it necessary to do it that way? And so, you only need one parent model for. You can have yeah, exactly. Model. That's the rule we've been following so far. No, no, that's a really good point. Yeah, maybe there exists a generalization where there, in principle, there exists an abstraction to having a single parent model for the entire code. But for pairs of transitions, you would have a parent model. And these are probably more interesting examples. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, is there like a systematic way for boundaries? Absolutely, yes, exactly. So, so that all comes from many condensation picture. We can talk about it more. It's, it's very elegant. Is there like a sufficient condition on the cycles in your graph that you know um, adjusts the different conditions could be like whole functions and then other sections of the section? So then, now we've been doing the group part so far. It would be really interesting. That's why we don't. Yeah, it, it, it's a little bit the decoding of those codes is also a little bit naughty and whole tolerance is a little bit yeah not there yet. Challenging to extend to say to encode n qubits uh, from this way. I mean, it's the same as in respective stabilizer codes. You can stack them, for example. So that's what we've been doing, right? With those triangle color codes, we just stack them on top of each other inside the But that's it's nothing new, really, right now. I, I have a quick question for you too. So you are telling us if we look at this operation, condensation, we can describe the morphism. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in the literature about onions, about fusion category, any other operation that we could bring in and do something else? Do some new build new cards, build new operations? I mean I mean, yeah, there there could be um, defects related to, to those like uh, Higher symmetries or higher groups, like all these generalized symmetries. Um, what, what is the this might not be. It might not be possible to obtain those from any condensation. That's the way we do this. But maybe there exists some way to bring any of those to condensation. So you mean building higher symmetries from? Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe one more about like uh, having more logical qubits. So if you have a you put your model on a like, higher genus surface, then you get uh, like I guess the level of your onions are all the same, but for different logical qubits, mm -hmm. your automorphism is not going to like it's going to be the same for each logical qubit. Or is there a way to differentiate them? Like you. When you say you have a synod like uh, gate, it's because you have two stacks. Mm -hmm. But what about within the same stack and you have synod like gates? Yeah, I mean, I mean, could you repeat the second half of the question? So, uh, it's like when you label your onions, you don't know what's the topology of the model you're doing. So, you, you don't make the difference between different logical qubits that would be in the same stack. And so is there a way to have in also to address basically between we don't know yeah I mean I mean not from naive picture that we have so far, but it would be really cool. Maybe there exists some spatial in the uniform picture that we could do to 
address the logical qubits. It's definitely very interesting. Also in, in the context of hyperbolic. Thanks, Maria. And that was your reminder to submit the uh,